Good morning, everybody. I can't believe it's here. The time, it just flies, doesn't it? I can't believe it's Easter. <laughs> Which is what I'm going to be saying in the spring, you know, it's just, that's the way time goes. So, um, recently my, my son, Josh, uh, introduced me to a new series on Netflix. It's called Medal of Honor, and it's a series um, where they are, each one of the series focuses on one of the uh, military uh, personnel who received uh, the highest honor that this country gives to uh, folks in the military who have faced with tremendous valor and courage um, a situation that was uh, dire and, uh, and oftentimes sacrifice their own lives uh, for their brothers and sisters in arms. And uh, so I've watched three of these. I don't know how many there are, but each one is just overwhelming. It's stunning what these people uh, did in uh, sacrifice for uh, their country. But but really for their, their brothers in arms, like I said. And uh, they have to put their own safety aside. They have to put all of the fear that is normal in this circumstance aside in order to do what they do. One of the guys who was being interviewed who had was a more recent recipient of the, uh, the Medal of Honor, uh, said in, in one of the little clips, he said, you're afraid. He said, if you're not afraid in these circumstances, there's something seriously wrong with you. So it's not that they don't have fear, it's that they are not led by their fear, that something else kicks in that allows them to uh, perform these acts of courage and valor. So we're talking in this little series um, about fear and hope. The hopes and fears of all the years is the phrase from uh, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The hopes and fears, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in me tonight. So fear is an emotion. It's a God-given emotion. Um, it's important that we have fear so that we can react. We have this, this response to fear. When something unexpected happens that we're confronted by, we have this emotional response, this physical response. It's often described as fight or flight. Right? So I'm either going to fight whatever it is in order to survive, or I'm going to flee uh, in order to try to survive. It's a good thing. Fear serves us well in that way. But the truth is, most of us carry around a fear that isn't because some threat comes along and confronts us where we have to, you know, fight it out or run away. It's it's not that kind of fear that, that we often carry around in us. We carry around oftentimes a fear of unknown things. Things that could happen. We carry around the what ifs in our head. In this study, I've been looking at fear and, and doing some reading and research on fear. And, and one of the things that, that I'm sure you know is that fear is a verb. Fear is a verb. It's an action. What I didn't know is that fear is an intransient, intransitive, intransitive verb. Meaning, it doesn't require an object. This is a little English lesson. You will be quizzed at the end, so please take notes. Intransitive verbs don't require an object. So you can have fear that isn't 
associated with anything in particular. That's the kind of fear that we're talking about. It's the fear kind of of the unknown, the things that could happen. We tend to fear things that we can't control, like the future. So we feel most comfortable when we are able to plan for and manage things in our lives. So our health, for example, you know, we're, we're concerned about our health. We're, we try to plan and, and take care of our health in some of us in some ways. Um, so I pay attention maybe to my diet or to exercise. I go to various doctors for, for uh, checkups and so forth. So all of that is a way to try and manage my health. Finances, same kind of thing, right? So we create spending plans and savings plans and so forth to try to manage our finances. We have jobs, we have families, kids, all of these things, and we try the best we can to plan for and manage these things. But stuff happens. Things come along that we have no control over. We could not have anticipated, and even if we did, there's nothing that we could do until whatever it is happens. And then what do you do? So we live our lives with this idea, with this understanding that there might be something out there looming just around the corner that could throw off all of our plans, all of our preparation, all of our sense of control. And that kind of fear influences how we think and how we act and our efforts to be in control. It's this fear of the unknown. One of the central characters in the Christmas story was confronted with, by just this kind of thing. Her name was Mary. She was a teenager, and she lived in a village in the uh, area of Israel called Galilee, and her life was kind of planned out. She kind of knew how her life was going to go because she was a normal young woman living in that area at that time, so she knew that at a certain age, she would likely get married to somebody in that same area of Nazareth, and that her role would be to take care of uh, the household, and when children came along, to care for the children, and her husband would take care of the work outside in order to provide the finances to take care of their lives, and they would go through life just like that. That, I'm sure, was Mary's plan. That's how life goes. That's how it works. But something happened that she could have never expected, she could have never planned for. So I want to look at that story with you this morning and see what we can learn from this teenager this young woman that God used in a really special way. So the story, uh, at least this version of it, is from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, It's the first chapter. And it starts like this, and the words will be on the screen. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin 
named Mary. I want to stop there for just a second and remind you of what we talked about. If you weren't here last week, we talked about Elizabeth and her husband, Zachariah, an elderly couple who had no children. Um, and, and the angel Gabriel appeared to the husband, who was a priest, and said, you're going to be having a child. Right? And uh, so fast forward, now Elizabeth has become pregnant. She is in her sixth month of pregnancy. The other thing I said is that Luke is about some interesting details in his gospel because Luke's whole intention in writing his gospel was to give an account for, a historical account of the life and teaching of Jesus and all that happened around him. And he wanted to include some details so people were clear. He wasn't writing a story. It's not a myth. It's not a fictional account. He's writing a historical account of the things that happened. And so he includes these little details like the fact that Elizabeth is in her sixth month of her pregnancy. So that's where we are in the time frame. God sent this angel Gabriel to Nazareth to uh, Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, she didn't see that coming. Right? That was not part of Mary's plan. That was an unexpected, unknown thing that's going to cast her life into a very different direction. What's interesting, there's a lot of things that are interesting in that, in that part of the story, right? So this angel appears to her, greets her, favored one. God, favor is resting on you. God's favor. That word favor in the Greek could also be translated grace. God's grace has come to you. In fact, the whole story of Christmas is a story of God's grace. We could just as easily call it Gracemas as we do Christmas. Maybe we should change it, you know? If we started it here, wouldn't that be cool? A hundred years from now when they were trying, why do we call it Gracemas? Well, it goes back to a little village called Voorheesen. Trying to control the future, are we, Pastor? But it's a story of grace. God's grace at work. And so this angel comes and says, Mary, God's grace is resting on you. Now her response is very different than Zachariah's response. Zachariah, if you remember, again, if you were here last week or you remember the story... It's description of Zechariah having Gabriel appear to him. It says that he was shaken and overwhelmed with fear. Here is this elderly priest, this guy who was true to the law and so forth, and he sees this angel and, and he is completely undone by this experience, both physically as well as emotionally and spiritually. We talked about why that might be last week. Here's this, this teenager who's confronted by this same angel, and she's not terrified, at least in this description. But she's confused. She's troubled. 
trying to figure out what does this mean? Why am I chosen for this? Why have I been selected? What have I done that would bring me this honor? May be the questions that are racing through this girl's mind. Why me? What, did, what have I done to deserve this? And the answer is nothing. She didn't, she wasn't selected, I don't believe, because she was so superior to all of the other faithful girls of her village or the nation. And I think we do a disservice to the story, to the understanding of who God is and how God works, to elevate Mary to a place where it's, well, it's because she was so faithful. She was so devout. She was so filled with goodness and grace and all of these wonderful characteristics that, that of course she was selected. You couldn't have selected anybody else. That's not what grace is about. Why did she deserve grace? She didn't. Any more than I do, any more than you do. This encounter between this angel and this teenager tells us more about the nature and plan of God than it tells us about angels and virgins and, and all of those other things that we tend to focus on in this story. Gabriel's just bringing a message. Mary is just the receiver of the message. God is the central character and God's grace. This is a, another story of God's grace. And the thing about God's grace is Nobody deserves it. We don't get God's grace because we've worked so hard. We've been so faithful. We've done everything right. And therefore, God rewards us with his grace. This whole idea of God's grace is explained beautifully and powerfully and simply and concisely in a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. It's the second chapter, and it's a familiar verse to some, maybe new to others of you, but worth looking at as we unpack this whole idea of, of grace. So in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, this is what it says. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's the nature of grace right there. God saved you by his grace. God's unmerited favor. God's free gift. You get salvation not because you've earned it. Not because of the good things that you do. but because of God's nature, God's plan, God's desire. The whole reason Jesus came is to offer us salvation that we can't otherwise earn. And all we have to do is believe it, receive it. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. So, just a, you know, silly illustration. 
um, we're at Christmas. So imagine Christmas Eve, after you've been here for a service, or two, you served at one and you attended one, so we'll say you went to two, you're home and uh, a knock comes on the door and there is a woman standing there and she says, uh, you don't know me, but I am uh, a distant cousin of yours. We've never met, um, but I have a gift for you and hand you the keys um, to a brand new SUV. Like this story? Right. Now, you didn't do anything to earn that, right? It's not because, oh, you've been my favorite uh, nephew or my favorite cousin, and, you know, we did all these th wonderful things. That you didn't even know this person prior to her showing up at the door and handing you these keys. That's the nature of grace. This is a free gift. Unearned, undeserved it's a gift. And all you have to do is reach out and take those keys. Then imagine that you've taken the keys and now you're driving around and you're bragging to everybody about your new car and all that you did to earn this new car. Right? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Way better than your car. Just saying. Um, and yeah, you know, I did this and that to earn this. It, it would be ridiculous, right? Or to say, you know, if somebody asked you to help them move something and you were to say, no, no, I don't want to scratch my car. Right? This gift was given to you as, as just that, a free gift. You receive it. There's no boasting about it. It's not because of anything that you've done. But there's work to be done, right? So now you become part of God's plan. God is going to work through you and through us in community to work his plan on earth until Christ returns. That's the nature of grace. So Mary didn't do anything to deserve this incredible um, honor to give birth to Jesus. She was selected for God's own purposes. So don't worry about it, Mary. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because of anything you did. This is a gift from God. You receive it. So here's the next part of the story then. Uh, verse 34, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more? Your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So Mary asks, you know, a legit question. How's this going to work? Right? Like she has just been cast into the unknown. Everything that she thought her life was going to be is now off the, off the table. Everything is going to change. It's going to change her relationship to Joseph, it's going to change her relationship to her community. It's going to change the way that she thinks about parents. Everything has changed in this moment. 
And so now she's just asking kind of logistics. How is this going to work? And what the angel says is, the Holy Spirit's got this. The power of God has got this. You just have to continue to trust God. This is how the story changes from fear to hope. I said that fear is an intransitive verb. I had to look this up. I've been trying to memorize this. I keep wanting to call it intransient. It's an intransient verb. No, it's an intrans... <laughs> Told you it was a quiz. It's an intransitive verb. Hope is transitive. It needs an object. Hope needs an object. We put hope into something. And so the question is, what do you put your hope into in this life? What is your hope based upon in this life that's going to throw you curves, that is going to not always go the way that you plan for it to go, that you work on it to go? There are going to be things that come along. You may be living that right now. You may have had these kinds of experiences already. When life doesn't go the way that you think, when fearful things come along, What's your hope? And so what Gabriel says to Mary is, place your hope in the power of God. Place your hope in the Spirit of God to do as God intends. God has a plan, Mary. You're a part of it. God's going to use you. Trust him. So that's the nature of hope, right? It's this expectation that God is going to do with you and in you and through you things that are for good for you and for the people whose lives you touch. It doesn't mean that everything that happens is good, but God is going to use it for good as you put your hope and your trust in him. So I've had the privilege over the years of walking with people in this community of faith who have had unexpected things happen. An unexpected diagnosis. An unexpected job loss. An unexpected death. Things have happened. And as I have walked alongside many of you, many of you in this room, you have laid hold to Christ as your hope. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean that you become fearless. It does mean that you fear less. And as your hope in him grows, your fear begins to diminish. It's God's grace. Jesus came to earth to bring God's grace, his unmerited favor, to offer you salvation. All we'd have to do, it's so simple, it's... it's Sometimes hard because it's so simple. All we have to do is to receive it and to put our trust in him. And it's such a blessing. And then God has stuff for us to do. So the uh, team is going to come back up. They're going to lead us in a, uh, in a closing song. As they're coming to get set up, let me just, let me just pray for us. So God, thank you. 
Thank you for Mary. For her um, example to us. Of what it looks like to uh, face an unknown future. With faith. Thank you, God, that it doesn't depend on our goodness, on our abilities. That grace is a gift that we receive. And that it's a humbling thing, God. It's not something we boast about. It's a humbling thing, and we want to use it. We want to use our faith to be a blessing to others. And so I pray that you'll be guiding our thoughts, our steps, our actions, our attitudes, so that we might bring hope into a world that deals with so much fear. And this is our prayer. This is our prayer on this Christmas Eve. <laughs> we pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.